Okay, so now that we've seen the fairly simple Euclidean geometry, let's now generalise this to the Minkowski geometry of space-time. So to keep things simple again, I'm going to consider the geometry of R2, or in this case R11. So this is just a two-dimensional space-time with one space coordinate and then R. CT coordinate. So, as I introduced you in the last video, we define the geometry by defining the line element, which essentially gives us the, well, the, the infinitesimal distance between two points in the geometry. So we define the line element using something called the metric and the metric tensor, and we write an expression that looks like this. Now I'm just going to suppress the tensor product for simplicity. So this expression here, the line element, which we saw is essentially controlled by the values of these numbers, these components. Remember these indices are going to run from zero up to the dimensionality of our space-time. So in the case where we have our 1, 1, a two-dimensional space-time, these metric components are essentially just going to be two by two matrix, and obviously they have to be symmetric, these components have to be equal, and as we're going to see, in the majority of cases, the metric turns out to be diagonal, so these off-diagonal components are just zero, and we just have these two components, and now this is going to, when we perform the expansion, this is just going to kind of become an expression which is just going to look like this. Okay, so hopefully this is familiar from the last video. This is just how we define a line element. And now we see this is all completely controlled by these two metric coefficients, or how many more coefficients you need for how many coordinates you have. So as we saw in the last video, the Euclidean geometry, the metric coefficients are very simple. This G0 and G11, they're just both equal to one. And so our line element just becomes the fairly simple Pythagorean theorem that we're familiar with. Now, as we move to special relativity, things become not entirely different, but different in a very distinct way, in that one of these components becomes negative. So, just sticking with our two-dimensional space-time for the moment, let me now define the Minkowski metric which is essentially given by the expression. Now we don't like to use G for the Minkowski metric, we give it its own symbol because it's that special. So it's usually referred to as eta. So the Minkowski metric, eta mu nu, is now the matrix, the diagonal matrix, minus one, and then one, and then continuing on with ones, if you have more space components. I'll just leave that for now. So this is for the two-dimensional Minkowski space. So now this is essentially where all of relativity comes from, the fact that we have this minus sign here. Now that's a fairly grandiose statement. All of relativity comes from this one minus sign it's going to essentially take us the rest of the series to fully appreciate the significance of this minus sign. But for now, let's just take it as is, and just take it to be the definition of our geometry, and now let's just study the effects that introducing a minus sign has for our geometry. So, before we move on, I just want to quickly point out that there is a convention being used here. We usually, or well, there are essentially now two choices we could have made. I could have chosen to put this minus sign where I did, effectively attached on the 0 component, which we know we like to say that the x0 is the kind of time coordinate, always, by definition, or by convention, sorry. So choosing to place our minus sign on the 0 component is one convention. We could have instead chosen the opposite convention and placed 
the minus sign on the space, coordinate or the space, a space like, if you like, a space. We could have placed the minus sign on a component which is associated to a space coordinate, but this is just a convention. And I want to, I just want to make it clear that, that this is a conventional choice and either are perfectly valid. We're just going to find it more useful, or at least a lot more people prefer to use this minus on the time component. And I'll just now say that if you have more space components, so the full space time of our universe, which is our 1, 3, we're obviously going to need four metric components. And the convention works out. Essentially, the convention which I've written here becomes minus on the time and then pluses on the three space components. And then the opposite convention would be plus on the time and then negative on all three space components. So what we're seeing is that it's the relative difference in sign between a time coordinate and a space coordinate, or the, the metric components associated with time and space dimensions, they have to have a relative minus or plus between them, and it doesn't matter which way around we choose the minus or plus, just so long as all the space and all the time components have the same and opposite sign. So as I said, we're going to stick with the minus plus 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 convention, but I will comment on a few places where it does turn out to be slightly more useful or more intuitively, or it makes more sense really to use the other convention, just makes the mouse work out a bit nicer in a few places, but I'll comment when we get there on the differences, but for now we're just going to stick with this. So all I've really done is just essentially write something down, just made a definition, now it's up to us to go forward and study the effects that this, or the consequences that this definition is going to have, and what this geometry is going to look like having a minus sign here instead of the all pluses, which we would be familiar with from Euclidean geometry. And we're going to see the effects that this minus are going to introduce is essentially going to lead to all of the relativistic effects. And we're going to realize that introducing this minus sign here makes the geometry of space-time vastly different to the geometry of the, the Euclidean geometry, which we'd be familiar with. Okay, so I'll just summarize what I introduced now. Essentially, all I've done is just made up some definition, or I didn't make it up, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you this is how things are. We're going to go forward and we're going to explore this in much more detail and see what this, the consequences of having this minus sign actually introduce. But for now, this is just the definition. This is how we define distances in Minkowski space. So I actually just forgot to write it down, so I'm just going to add this in from the end into the right place. But now, having these metric components, we have minus one and a plus one. Let's just see what the line element looks like. Well, essentially, we're going to have ds squared is now minus dx naught squared. Remember, dx naught is this ct. So we're going to have minus c squared dt squared, and now plus dx1 squared, which in our case is just x, so plus dx squared. So this is the line element of Minkowski space. So we're going to explore this in much, much more detail in, coming, in upcoming videos, but just a really brief comment, which we can already see. So this is the form of our line element, and now we're going to explore this in much more detail in upcoming videos, but I just want to already point a few things out. So we can see from this expression, well, we have ds squared. Let's just see what happens when we take the square root and consider ds. Okay, so I'm going to go into much more detail about this in future videos, but I just want to already kind of point out a few interesting features that we can already kind of read off from the form of this line element. So the expression is ds squared. Let's just briefly consider ds by taking the square root. So 
first of all, one thing we should immediately realize is that this ds, we're no longer going to have this positive, def positive definite condition that we had with the Euclidean, or Roman the, the Euclidean metric. Essentially, positive definiteness means that the line element is always greater than zero. Essentially, you can't have, at least in Euclidean space, you can't have distances which are negative or even equal to zero. The separation between two distinct points in Euclidean space is always going to be positive. That's positive, defin positive definiteness. But now as we move to Minkowski space, this completely changes and we no longer have the positive definiteness condition. From this, just from this expression here, we, can, we could potentially have the case where the ds could potentially be equal to zero if dx squared is equal to c squared dt squared. We could potentially have then ds squared is equal to zero. And now even because of the minus sign here, this argument of the square root could also be negative, and ds squared would then be imaginary. So this is in stark contrast to the Euclidean case, where we will always have positive and non-zero distances. But in Minkowski space, we can have two points in Minkowski space, which are essentially distinct points, but they're separated by zero distance. And not only they, could they have zero distance between them, they could even have an imaginary distance between them. So this is very kind of perplexing. How can two distinct points have zero space-time distance between them? Well, we're going to see in future videos what this means. But for now, I just wanted to point out, already we can see some really, really major differences starting to appear from our Euclidean picture.